It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth David, who, I'll just full disclosure right away, we are both uh, Wellesley College alumni, so we have an undergraduate connection there. She did her uh, training at George Washington, Georgetown, Georgetown which I always get confused, uh, as Benson knows, and uh, then did her uh, thoracic oncology training at MD Anderson. And today she's going to talk to us about a really interesting topic because there's so much information in the press that makes this confusing. So hopefully we'll clarify all of this for all of us about mesothelioma. So Dr. David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And I would like to welcome everyone who is participating online uh, this morning. And um, we, if you would like to participate in the discussion, uh, send questions, there are two ways to do that. Uh, you can participate through Twitter with using the hashtag UCD surgery, or you can send email questions to thoracic at ucdavis.edu. So, um, I don't have any disclosures, but I did think that it was important to acknowledge one thing. Um, obviously, I am a surgeon, and um, surgery for mesothelioma is uh, controversial. So um, I'm hoping to sort of minimize the bias in my talk, but there probably will be a little bit. Um, so we have some objectives this morning. One, I hope you will all come away with understanding more of the demographics and basics about mesothelioma. Um, I'd like to go through the NCCN guidelines for staging and evaluation for these patients. And then we'll go through the surgical options um, for treatment and also for palliation for these patients. And then finally, we'll cover the, uh, the resources that we have here at Davis uh, for mesothelioma patients. So um, <clears throat> let's start off with this statement. Mesothelioma is a common type of lung cancer. What, what do people think about that statement? True, false? False. Okay, what's false about it? Okay, it's not lung cancer. Right. Is it common? Yes, no, maybe. All right, so the whole statement is wrong. It's not common and it's not lung cancer. So um, just to start off kind of proving that point, this is the um, front page of the National Cancer Institute website. And I just wanted to highlight this section here common cancer types, mesothelioma is not on this list, okay? So <clears throat> it is not common at all. So we see about 3,000 cases of mesothelioma in this country each year. Just to put it in reference, we see 224,000 new cases of lung cancer each year, okay? So that's about, 3,000 is about 1% of 224. Um, in contrast, and this actually demonstrates the point that Dr. Farmer just made, everybody's heard of mesothelioma, okay? So I Googled it, because that's sort of the ultimate thing to do nowadays, and Google yields about 10 million search results for mesothelioma. And in contrast for lung cancer, there's about 36 million hits that you'll get. So again, we have a 1% sort of incidence but this is about 27% in terms of popular and social media literature. So <clears throat> what are the risk factors for mesothelioma? Anybody have any ideas? Asbestos, definitely. Number one, any others? Are there any other risk factors? I see some heads nodding yes. So other elemental exposures, um, zeolite is one that's been linked. And then rarely mesothelioma is associated with radiation exposure and some viral exposures. Smoking is not considered a risk factor. Now this is a little bit controversial, but the, right now the prevailing opinion is that, yes, Dr. Pedic. There are a couple people wondering what zeolite is. <laughs> It's an element that is found um, in the environment and it's also used in, typically in road construction um, projects. So, sorry, okay. So just to sort of go into what asbestos is because it's something again we've all heard of but not necessarily know what it is. So it's a heat resistant uh, material that can be woven into fabrics. It can also be incorporated into asphalt. It can be incorporated into any number of building material construction project, uh, products. And it's been used for a very, very long time. 
So historically, there's evidence that the Greeks used it uh, to weave clothing for their slaves that would be heat resistant. Uh, Romans also used it to make tablecloths, napkins, because they could throw the fabric into the fire to clean it, but the fabric itself wouldn't burn. Um, the Romans also started using it in the construction of buildings. But really, the Industrial Revolution is where the primary use of asbestos came into play. And it became heavily involved with the mining industry, mining of asbestos, and then al also in manufacturing. That's where we saw really the um, heavy use in insulation projects, um, et cetera. But it wasn't until the 1970s that we really started to see correlations between asbestos exposure and use and lung disease. Um, so that's a really long time if you think about it. So 3,000 years worth of use and then really it's only been in the last 40 years that we've started to understand the relationship. So this is a historical paper that I found um, from the 70s and this is a paper from Australia and <clears throat> it's an autopsy study and basically they really, this is one of the first times that the um, environmental exposure were linked with autopsy findings of not only mesothelioma, but pleural disease. Um, and interestingly, they not only had those findings, but it, this was a paper that actually sort of first started making the point that it is important to take an occupational history um, on patients where there may be an occupational exposure um, leading to a disease process. So, <clears throat> Asbestos causes not only mesothelioma, but it causes another type of lung disease called asbestosis, okay, which is a different and totally separate process from mesothelioma. Um, there's confusion. A lot of people think they're one and the same, but they are not. So asbestosis is um, basically shown here in this CAT scan, and it's this process that's really a diffuse fibrosis of the lungs. Um, and it's due to actual inhalation of the asbestos, asbestos fibers themselves. Um, it has a very long latent period, 30, 40 years after you've had your primary exposure. And unfortunately, this is not a curable um, disease process. It is a treatable disease process, and that's done with uh, symptom management. And then we have mesothelioma. So asbestosis and mesothelioma are the two processes in the lung that are linked uh, with asbestos exposure. So let's get back to mesothelioma. So in my opening question, we all established that mesothelioma is not lung cancer, okay? It's not lung cancer. The cells of origin for mesothelioma are actually mesothelial cells, and they are found throughout the body. Um, approximately 75% of cases of mesothelioma occur in the pleura, but they also occur in the peritoneum, tunica vaginalis, and pericardium. These last two have obviously a very rare incidence, probably only 1 to 2%. There are three pathologic subtypes of mesothelioma. Epithelial is the most common subtype. Um, mixed subtype is a combination of epithelial and sarcomatoid, and it's the second most prominent. And then sarcomatoid is the most aggressive form of um, histology. Uh, okay, so there are many, many historical series um, sort of establishing the natural history of mesothelioma. And um, really, I was trying to go for new literature, so I found this article published in 2014. And um, it's interesting to me. This is actually a tumor registry from Iran, and they have 60 patients in their registry, which started in 2010. And um, really, they looked at different clinical um, and pathologic uh, characteristics of the patients and did a survival analysis. So what we see here is their overall survival analysis for all of their patients. And um, as we see, it's pretty poor, okay? This is survival time measured in days. Most of us are, using, are used to seeing survival curves measured in years. Um, so they found a median overall survival for all comers of 10.8 months. So that's, that's pretty pretty short time. They did a subset analysis um, looking at the histologic types, and they see the, the trend that is known for mesothelioma. So the middle line here is actually the epithelioid subtype, 
which is typically the subtype that you quote unquote want to have. It's the most common and it's of the forms, it's the least aggressive, it's the most responsive to therapy. The solid line is the sarcomatoid subtype, um, which is the most aggressive. This dashed line is actually the unidentified subtypes, um, which is pretty, it's not uncommon to not be able to identify which subtype the patients fall into. And um, it's believed that uh, the unidentified subtypes typically behave more like epithelial than sarcomatoid, which is reflected in this graph. <coughs> so who does it affect? Anyone have any ideas? Men, women? Men, right. What? It affects everyone, but it does affect men more than women. And this is primarily due to the environmental and occupational related exposures. So um, right now, women make up about 25 to 30 percent of, pop of the population of mesothelioma patients. We may see that shift um, in our lifetime as there are um, exposures not just with occupation. Um, typically, the, in this country, Caucasians and Hispanics are typically diagnosed with mesothelioma more commonly than other racial groups. And the median age at diagnosis is about 72 in this country. Um, mesothelioma being diagnosed at under age 45 is really very rare, um, but it does happen, and it's probably related again to that long latency period um, for this disease. So there's no geographic predominance, and um, this is from the CDC, uh, just demonstrating the mortality data from 2001 to 2010. And um, the darker states have a slightly higher uh, death rate than the uh, light brown states, and then the states that are white um, just had no data reported. It doesn't necessarily mean that they had no cases. Um, <coughs> okay, so symptoms. So there are a lot of symptoms for this disease. Um, in fact, they are sort of nondescript symptoms. So patients can have chest or back pain, um, which may signify invasion into the chest wall or bony involvement. Uh, they can have dyspnea, pleural effusions are extremely common, um, cough, fever, fatigue, generally feeling poorly um, is associated with this, this disease. And um, dysphagia and hoarseness can be signs of mediastinal invasion. Um, patients who have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, you should suspect intra-abdominal involvement. And then um, weight loss can be common in any um, distribution of disease. So how do we find mesothelioma? How do we make this diagnosis? So this is a really hard diagnosis to make. Um, patients will typically have symptoms for several months um, before a definitive diagnosis is made. So obviously, just like everything in medicine, we need a complete and very thorough history and physical. And you want to take that occupational history. You want to take an exposure history. You know, don't just take, a man well, I worked in manufacturing. You need to delve a little bit further than that if you're really thinking that mesothelioma may be on your differential. Currently, we don't, recognize, we don't recommend any screening test for this disease. And that's, again, primarily due to the low incidence of the disease. Um, however, in patients who have a known asbestos exposure history, um, most physicians will recommend annual imaging of their chest done on a routine basis. And then um, there is some exploration into uh, checking levels of soluble mesothelian-related peptides. Um, as a serum marker of disease, and I'll get a little bit further into that in a second. And then certainly patients um, who have a new symptom, this, this deserves a thorough evaluation and workup. So um, the search for a serum screening test is ongoing, and for a few years now, um, there's been some hope placed in these soluble mesothelian-related peptides. Um, this is a meta-analysis from late last year, uh, which looked at about 30 studies. And unfortunately, uh, their conclusion was that really negative results weren't enough to exclude mesothelioma, and positive results just mean that you really need to do further investigations. So um, people haven't abandoned this uh, area, but this is not looking like it's going to be the holy grail that people were hoping it would be.
So um, just a little cartoon um, for this week, I thought it was appropriate. Um, and what it says down here at the bottom, one last thing, our health insurance does not cover mesothelioma. When can you start? Um, this was actually drawn by a cartoonist who had a friend who was recently diagnosed with mesothelioma, and he drew it to sort of motivate his friend. So, All right, so let's talk about the um, guidelines for evaluation of these patients. So um, the NCCN uh, puts out guidelines for most all cancers for both diagnosis, staging, and treatment. So we'll start with the initial evaluation. So again, we're gonna have a patient who has either recurrent pleural effusion as, as a very common symptom um, or pleural thickening. And you're gonna first step is typically gonna be a CT chest if they haven't already had it. And um, typical CT findings for mesothelioma are highlighted here with this pleural thickening. There's a little fluid there. And again, but you see this very thickened pleura and some calcifications. This is another way of looking at it where you can just see that the pleura is literally becoming thick and it's trapping the lung. So this really demonstrates why patients become symptomatic. It literally becomes hard to breathe because the lung is, is encased. So once we have those CT findings, we need to get some tissue. So um, this is a pleural fluid aspirate cell block and um, Pleural fluid aspiration, thoracentesis, this will yield a diagnosis in about 30% of samples, 30 to 50% of samples. So this becomes exactly why patients may be worked up for months before they get a definitive diagnosis. So they may have pleural aspirate, that doesn't really yield anything. They'll move on to a transthoracic FNA, so a pleural biopsy done with a fine needle aspirate. And here you can see these um, polygonal cells with lots of thickened cytoplasm. Um, this only leads a, yields a diagnosis in about 30% of cases. So that leads us to surgery. So surgery is becoming the gold standard for tissue diagnosis for mesothelioma. It's just something that should be done with VATS and um, it allows both a diagnostic and therapeutic alternative for the patient. Um, and we can do talc pleuridesis at the same time that we're getting tissue for specimen. Um, this will yield a diagnosis in about 80% of cases. So um, typically when we do a VATS, uh, we're all about triangulation. So we have our camera in one place and then we'll have working ports on either side of the chest. And that just allows the best angulation, best view, best chance for working. For mesothelioma, we don't wanna do it that way, okay? You wanna minimize the number of incisions. If you can do it with just one incision or two incisions, that's best. And you're gonna put your incisions in the same inner space, and you're gonna try to put them in the inner space that if you are going to do more operations on this patient for mesothelioma, they're going to be in the same inner space that you're going through, because these incisions should be resected at that time if you're doing a definitive procedure. So this is an interoperative photo of a VATS uh, pleural biopsy for mesothelioma. So this is very different than our typical VATS um, look like. So as you can see, it's, it's very bloody. That's why the picture is so dark. Um, it's not exsanguinating hemorrhage. It's, this is just what mesothelioma looks like. Um, and here we can see this very thickened pleura. This is um, one of the specimens we were taking for biopsy. And this is another look at it. So this is what we call an extra pleural plane here. This is actually the pleura itself. It's been separated from the chest wall. This is the lung underneath um, that's atelectatic. So um, this is the type of specimen we take, and this typically will yield us a diagnosis. So once we um, have our diagnosis, we move on to sort of a pre-treatment algorithm. So if typically the patient's only had a CT chest at that point, you may get further studies with an abdominal CT. Um, which is typically gonna look here where you see this thickening of the peritoneum and um, slightly suggests that there's some air fluid levels. This patient may have a bowel obstruction. So this is more advanced disease. So <coughs> um, 
And again, if, if you suspect intra-abdominal disease, then you need to do a diagnostic laparoscopy on the patient and do some peritoneal washings, peritoneal biopsies to make that d diagnosis definitively. So now we have our um, diagnosis and we're working on our staging. So we'll go through staging in a minute here. And mes mesothelioma is staged just using a TNM system like everything else. Um, as you can see, it's relatively complicated and specific. I'm not gonna go through this in great detail. The bottom line here is that basically T1 through T3 are things that we typically will consider resectable um, disease. The N staging is just as it is for non-small cell lung cancer, and M staging is either M0 or M1, so any metastasis gets you an M1. So if we um, look here, at our staging system, so our early stage patients and patients with epithelial and mixed histologies, those are gonna be the patients who will move on to pre-surgical evaluation. So stage four or sarcomatoid, those folks are gonna move on to chemotherapy directly. So in evaluating a patient for surgery, we're gonna obtain a PET scan. PET scan for mesothelioma is classically gonna look like this, where again, we see this pleural thickening all around the chest and we see some FTG avidity within that pleural thickening. You're also at this time gonna evaluate the patient to see what, what surgery they can tolerate. Um, it's a good idea to know if your patient can undergo and tolerate a pneumonectomy prior to taking them to the operating room. So stress tests, PFTs will be very helpful for that. These patients occasionally will need a VQ scan as well. So, once we have that, those data, it tells us here we have their stage and we know whether or not they're medically operable. For those patients who um, are medically operable and are appropriate stage, the NCCN guidelines gives us a choice, okay? We can go with induction chemotherapy followed by reassessment for surgery, or we can go right to surgery. Now, there are not a lot of cancers where that's really left so up to the providers. And a lot of this, there's built-in flexibility because there's hope that a lot of these patients will be on clinical trials when they get to this setting. And so this flexibility allows for um, different protocol strategies for their treatment. So let's talk now about surgery. So, Surgery, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is very controversial for mesothelioma because it's typically been very high risk um, and the results just have not been great. It's persisted in the treatment plan because the other treatment modalities are not that great either. Uh, radiation options are very limited for this disease and chemotherapy is not as effective for mesothelioma as it is for some other cancers, although they're making as many strides as we are making on the surgical side. So um, probably the biggest area of controversy stems around this issue and this idea that you know, as surgeons, we try to get all the cancer out. Regardless of what cancer we're going after, you try to get it all out. For mesothelioma, that's not always theoretically or even practically possible. Um, so this idea of complete resection is very much a challenge for surgeons. Um, and again, these surgeries are very high risk. So the 70s are really when we started doing um, operations for mesothelioma. And this is a historical series from the 70s, 1976. This is the first surgical series published on extrapleural pneumonectomy. So this was um, 29 patients and um, Again, they had 29 surgical patients and they had some non-surgical patients mixed in as well that they followed outcomes for. <coughs> so this is the breakdown of the histologies for their patients. Again, mostly epithelial and mixed histology. There was one sarcomatoid patient in the mix here. And this is what they found. So their post-operative survival um, was pretty dismal. Hospital mortality in this series was 30%. Okay, can you guys imagine that? I mean, is there any operation that we do now that has a hospital mortality of 30%? No, we don't get away with that anymore. Um, but this is an important series um, really because of this table where they looked at, um, they looked at why these people died 
and whether or not they died for reasons that they could have prevented. So they had nine deaths, and they looked, and seven of them were th what they called theoretically preventable. So this led directly into improvements in the procedure and technique and perioperative care that have improved outcomes significantly. So the two operations that we do for mesothelioma are called pleurectomy decortication and extrapleural pneumonectomy. Um, the surgical adjuncts that are sometimes used in combination with either of these operations are hyperthermic chemo that is infused in the operating room at the same time and um, very high dose um, hemithoracic radiation that can be administered after extrapleural pneumonectomy. So EPP um, is basically a resection of the entire lung on block with pericardium, diaphragm, all of the pleura, and removal of the sixth rib. Okay, um, surgeons who accomplish this operation believe that they are, this is the best way to achieve all, removal of all of the tumor. We've also seen, and I'll show you some data shortly, that ex there are now acceptable rates of morbidity and mortality for this procedure. We're no longer seeing a 30% in-hospital death rate. And <coughs> again, this procedure allows for administration of high-dose radiation. The uh, pleurectomy decortication is an operation that involves just removal of the pleura and the sixth rib, an extended PD, <laughs> will involve resection of the pleura, also uh, resection of the pericardium and diaphragm, and removal of that sixth rib. So people who believe in this operation typically believe that it is all about cytoreduction. So you're acknowledging that you're probably getting an R1 resection in these patients, meaning you're leaving microscopic disease behind. Um, however, this is a procedure that's easier to tolerate um, than an EPP. And um, it is an effective part of multimodality treatment regimens. Um, high dose radiation is not given after PD because the lung is still in place, but there are other options um, for multimodality treatments. So this is what this operation looks like. So this is not minimally invasive thoracic surgery. So we divide the latissimus, we typically divide the serratus. Um, this is a, a big incision for, for either procedure, okay? And this is, this is the operation, this is how it proceeds. So if you look at this cartoon, we've got this big incision, and we would expect that the lung is going to fall away from the chest wall. In a mesothelioma case, it does not do that. The surgeon literally has to use blunt dissection to get the lung to fall away from the chest wall because of the pleural tumor. So this is an intraoperative photograph um, that, that demonstrates that. So you can see the incision is here and the rib has been removed here to facilitate um, entry into the chest. So this is the chest wall, this is endothoracic fascia that's been skeletonized and exposed. And this is underlying um, lung with the thickened pleural tumor attached to it. This is just a blown up picture of that thickened pleural tumor. So this is another cartoon that's demonstrating this whole idea of skeletonizing the chest. You want to skeletonize the chest wall. You want to skeletonize the entire hilum and mediastinum uh, to really remove all of the pleural surfaces. So, and this is just another picture, again, demonstrating the exposed chest wall and the decorticated lung so that the pleural tumor has now been removed from the lung. So this is a picture of an intraoperative specimen from an EPP. So this is a resected lung. We can see the hilum of the lung here with the bronchus uh, divided here. This is pericardium and this is diaphragm. So this is all removed on block as one specimen. This is a specimen from uh, a pleurectomy decortication. So as you can see here is that thickened pleural tumor and it's sort of just a blob of tissue because the lung has been left in the patient and so the, the lung is essentially what holds this other tumor together. So when you don't remove the lung, you end up with this amorphous tissue. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about some modern results um, for this operation. So um, <coughs> this is a, a recent series from the Brigham of um, a 24-year experience with doing this operation. 
And uh, they've done so many that they are able to publish papers just with epithelioid patients. So this is, again, over 24 years. They had 529 patients in this series. Um, their 30-day mortality was 5%, and their 90-day mortality was 8%. So that is a dramatic improvement from that 1976 series. So on um, survival analysis, they found actually a couple of things. So female gender and young patients actually had a little better survival than males and older patients. Um, they did find that laterality of the procedure and length of stay had no bearing on survival. Their overall survival curve is here. And um, if you remember back to the previous um, paper, the median survival in this series is much higher. So median survival for these folks, 18 months, and they had a one-year survival of 67%. So that's that's pretty good for these patients. If you remember back to the very first series I presented that showed a median survival for the overall disease at 10.5 months. Um, so, you know, getting another six months for these folks is not insignificant. So now we have to answer the question of which procedure is better. What should we be doing? Should we be doing pleurectomy decortication or should we be doing EPP? Well, the best way to answer that that question is going to be with a randomized trial. However, in this country, we have so few cases and we have enough geographic distribution for those cases that a randomized trial is quite a challenge to accrue. So um, probably one of the next best things is a comparative effectiveness study. And this was undertaken by the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering. This is a retrospective analysis. Um, three centers combined their data and they ended up with 633 patients in this series. So they looked at patients who had had EPP versus patients who had PD. And what they found was that the EPP patients tended to be a little bit younger than PD. There was a little bit more uh, early stage disease in the PD patients. Um, and the uh, EPP patients were slightly more likely to have multimodality therapy than the PD group. So what does all this mean? Um, so really, in looking at uh, the effectiveness of the procedure, they wanted to look at disease recurrence and overall survival. So the first thing they looked at was recurrence. And not surprisingly, local recurrence was much higher in the PD group than in the EPP group. Um, the EPP patients tended to have more distant recurrences. So now they did their survival analysis, and they started, again, by looking at histology. And this top line, the better line, is the epithelioid patients. The non-epithelioid patients are here. So median survival was 16 months for the epithelioid patients versus nine months for non-epithelioid patients. When they looked at survival by stage, no one should be surprised by this, stage one, much better survival. Um, 38 months median survival, and uh, it drops off dramatically as you increase your stage. Um, so now what they looked at was their two procedures. So they did a head-to-head -head comparison, and actually PD won out. Uh, PD had a 16-month survival, and uh, EPP 12-month median survival, and that was uh, significantly different. So. Then they further broke it out into stage of disease. And um, I'm not going to show you all four of those graphs. But what they found was that for stage one and two, for the early stage patients, there really was no survival difference between EPP, which had a 19-month median survival, and PD, which had 23-month. So this led them to conclude that they really couldn't make a definitive conclusion. Um, and that because of selection bias in the patients and surgeon preference, that really surgeons should continue to select the patients for the procedure they were either most comfortable doing or felt most, com most um, appropriate for the patient. But it's allowed for an ongoing and continuous debate. So another attempt at answering that question was just undertaken um, by another group from New York. And this is an article that's in press, and this is a meta-analysis um, for survival, and again, comparing the two procedures. 
So they had 24 distinct data sets um, that made up this meta-analysis. And as you can see, they had varying ranges of histologies, varying ranges of stage in these series. And they ended up with 1,500 patients in the PD group and 1,300 patients in the EPP group. And what they found was that EPP had a 4.5% procedural mortality rate and um, PD was 1.7%, which was statistically different. So then they looked at um, papers favoring either procedure in terms of survival. And really, they didn't, they didn't find a clear advantage for one procedure or the other. It was 47% for PD and 53% for EPP. Then they further looked at two-year survival based on these series, and they found no difference between the two procedures. So we had 23.8 months versus 25%, uh, excuse me, 23.8% uh, versus 25. So that was not different. So um, they also looked at complications between the two procedures, and I think just looking at this table alone here, you see much less font in the PD category compared to the EPP category. So procedural complications much, much higher for EPP. So where does this lead us? So what they concluded was that PD is associated with about a two and a half um, lower mortality in the immediate short-term period than EPP. And so they actually concluded that pleurectomy decortication should be preferred when it's technically feasible. Now, this is one group's opinion uh, based on this meta-analysis, and this shouldn't be considered a definitive answer. Um, but it plays into the controversy. So um, where are we going in the future? So I think that therapeutic intent surgery for mesothelioma is going to remain very controversial. and. Um, there are going to be continued attempts to answer the question of which procedure is better. Um, currently, the randomized trials that are in development aren't being developed to answer that question. Um, one is a trial that's going to look at PD um, with chemotherapy, and they're looking at whether you give the chemotherapy up front or to follow the procedure. And then a second trial is a trial looking at PD with chemotherapy versus chemotherapy alone. Um, it doesn't mean that we won't see studies looking at EPP versus PD in the future. We're just not seeing them in development right now. So um, we did have a question that was emailed to us ahead of time. And it was the question was whether or not um, nutrition played a role in mesothelioma. And I think as surgeons, we're all very familiar with the role that nutrition plays for surgery. Um, and I was curious about this question myself. So I did a literature search. And um, this was a series of 97 patients um, with mesothelioma. And all they did was check serum protein levels before they started treatment. And what they found was that there was a 72% survival in patients who had a normal albumin and only 44% in patients who had an albumin of less than 3.5. So again, just data showing that <coughs> nutrition is important for not only surgery, but for cancer survival. So I'd just like to wrap up with going over the resources that we have here at UC Davis. So um, the NCCN guidelines recommend that patients are evaluated in a multidisciplinary setting. We offer that here with our thoracic multidisciplinary tumor board, which consists of surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, um, pulmonologists, and clinical trials faculty um, that really provide a thorough evaluation for these patients. We offer minimally invasive diagnostic and staging modalities for these folks. We offer surgery, radiation, and medical oncology here. And we have some clinical trials that I'm going to discuss in a second. And then these last two are very important um, issues for all cancer patients, but especially for mesothelioma patients. We offer oncology nurse navigation, and we also offer not only social, but cancer survivorship support uh, for patients and families. So we have three clinical trials currently offered here. The first <coughs> is a trial for a, um, this is a safety and feasibility study for a, um, VEGF inhibitor um, versus placebo, um, and it's given in combination with standard chemotherapy for mesothelioma. Our second trial 
is um, a CMET inhibitor trial that um, is for patients who have previously been treated for mesothelioma but who have had disease progression um, or recurrence. And then our last trial is actually a PDL1 inhibitor trial. This is um, an immune modulated trial um, looking at um, one of the PDL1 inhibitors and its effectiveness in solid tumors. So, lastly, um, just to reiterate the importance of the thorough evaluation diagnosis. Um, that's really what leads you to these decision trees. And again, it's the early stage patients with the epithelioid and um, mixed histologies who are, under gonna, who are gonna undergo the very thorough evaluation for surgery consideration. And the more advanced disease or sarcomatoid histologies, those are the folks who are gonna move directly into chemotherapy treatment. So I'd like to acknowledge our team. Um, a disease as complicated as this is not something that one individual can undertake. This really is a team effort, and um, all of these providers are instrumental in, in successful care of these patients. So I'd like to stop now and take any questions that we have either from the audience or from online. Thank you. Yes. Well, I think that different countries are doing different things in terms of banning um, mesothelioma use, uh, or sorry, asbestos use. Um, so I think worldwide, uh, the incidence is, is probably going to remain high. Um, the actual incidence of the disease has been pretty stable in this country for a long time. Um, but I think it's going to take years and years, probably our lifetime, you know, we will still be seeing the disease. It may take a couple of generations for the disease to go away. Um, but I think because it's, as we talked about, it's not just asbestos, there are other elemental exposures that can lead to the disease that it probably won't go away completely. So. Yes, Dr. Farmer. So we're told that we have a high incidence whatever that uh, secondary serpentine mm -hmm. in the Eldorado Hills area, mm -hmm. so that this area is, uh, uh, could have a higher risk. Do we see that in patients? Are we in an area that has a higher incidence of mesothelioma than other? We are not right now, and in fact, we're California is not in that higher highest category of um, mortality rates. Um, but, you know, again, that may be something that changes with time due to the latency. Um, and is there any increased incidence among rock climbers or people, I guess, road construction would be another right. place that would be exposed to that? Road construction, yes. Rock climbers, no. <laughs> yes, Dr. Cook. Uh, we have a question uh, uh, sent by uh, uh, email from Cynthia. What immunotherapy is available for mesothelioma patients after surgery? Sure. So um, there are a couple of trials um, from the uh, early 2000s and late 90s that explored the options of IL-1 um, and interferon um, infusions intraoperatively. Um, those trials sort of showed equivocal results, and they haven't really been explored further at this time, but that's one thing that um, people with an interest in this disease sort of keep in the back of their mind as something that may be an adjunct in the future. And then um, our clinical trials that we offer here at Davis um, would be considered um, immunotherapy based on the, the molecular targets of the drugs that are being tested. Yes? I have a question. You know, this is a rare disease. You said there's only 3,000 cases per year. Uh, yet, uh, there, there's obviously some centers do EGP, extraordinary and, and or <coughs> others. Yes. With data that suggests better outcomes in regards to volume, uh, for many cases such as softjectomy, pancreatectomy, and tablet, how do you, how does one develop good outcomes in a low volume? So 
you know, I think that the idea of having an excellent multidisciplinary team becomes crucial. <laughs> and you're going to rely on the training of those team members. Um, so you yourself may not be a high volume center, but when you have people who have trained in high volume centers, they're able to bring the techniques to that center and um, ensure quality outcomes that way. And I think that when you're a center that is high volume for other related um, cancers and disease processes, those outcomes can spill over into areas where you may not be high volume. And um, those are important principles. Um, and you know, this is a, a learning process for physicians who take care of this disease. The high volume centers will put on courses, clinics, et cetera, to teach people how to take care of these patients. And it's important as providers to continue that lifelong learning process to make yourself better and it enhances your patient care. Any other questions? There's one more question. Yes. So um, really, the, um, <coughs> the soluble uh, mesothelin-related peptides, people put a lot of stock in that. And it doesn't seem that that is paying off. Um, right now, there are not really other serum tests that are being excluded, um, explored. So for now, the serum testing is not really an, a viable um, option for patients. Um, it's really going to be more symptom exploration and investigation if they are having symptoms and they have had asbestos exposure. Anything else? Uh, yes. Um, is there still a role for radiotherapy uh, in this disease? And then if there is, uh, what is the uh, best way to deliver it back in the day? Uh, brachytherapy seed implants into uh, gel foam laid on the uh -huh. denuded pleural surfaces was used and then the radiation therapy got a little more uh, sophisticated and then uh, hemithoracic radiation and of course now we have uh, particularly here uh, more sophisticated options so is there a role and if there is uh, how should it be delivered? So there is a role. Um, there is a role for uh, basically two branch points. Um, the first branch point is uh, therapeutic radiation, which is pretty much right now reserved for um, post-EPP. And it's the modality termed IMRT, um, which is basically a hemithoracic radiation that is delivered to the whole chest. Um, and it's only used after EPP because the toxicity to the lung is very high. Um, there are some centers who are exploring using it um, after PD, but that's on clinical trial and that's only in a very few specialized centers. So that's, that's one role for radiation. Um, another role for radiation is for palliation. Um, when patients have disease progression, they typically will have disease progression in the form of invasion into adjacent structures. And invasion of a pleural tumor into the chest wall is a very painful process. So palliative radiation actually works very well in that setting and is very commonly employed um, for sort of palliation and pain control. So. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. For that. Thank Excellent. you.